Naranjo. How you doing? Great. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Scotty, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Where are you coming to us from right now? I am in, uh, my husband and I are in upstate New York. By Wait, what, 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 what part of upstate? Uh, it's very close to uh, Hunter Mountain, you know, the ski area. I don't know Hunter Mountain. It's just up from, uh, from New York City. Okay. The, the reason I ask is because I'm originally from central New York. So I'm like, but I'm like four and a half hours up. So I'm, I'm, I'm past that area. From where? I'm from Utica, New York. You hear of it? Yes. Yeah. But now I'm in, now I'm in the Utica, city. Where I went to grad school and, and had a great time with, you know, the, that area of New York is just so beautiful. Yeah. You're originally from uh, Southern Colorado though, right? I am where the mountains are very, very tall and it's very, very dry. <laughs> so wait, how long did you live in Colorado? Let's see. Um, mm, not that long. <laughs> really? Just early I, childhood? I went to the University of Colorado at the age of 17, and I transferred to the University of Oklahoma at the age of 18. Okay. In my, uh, my sophomore year. So I only lived in Colorado. I was born in Los Angeles because my parents eloped. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, my, my dad had a, a, an older sister who lived in L.A. Okay. Uh, so I would say about 14 years. Okay, so you moved from L.A. when you were about three? About three, yeah. Oh, okay, so you don't remember much about living there? I do remember a couple of things. I do remember the Redondo Beach Boardwalk very, very well. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, the funny uh, things that you remember. Yeah, I know. There's random things that when you're young, you just for some reason pick them up and then forget everything else, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's what, <laughs> yeah. what did your parents do when you were young? Um, my father was an auto mechanic and my mother worked for the University of Colorado Health Services. Okay. Um, but they both really, well, my father came from a family of musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather, uh, uh, whom I never knew because he died when my father was young, um, <clears throat> but he was a pianist and string player. Oh, okay. And he used to have people over. Um, he, he was actually a farmer by profession, but he used to have people over because, you know, there's this whole time between about November and the next March when, you know, there's a lot of hangout time. So he used to arrange jams. So my father had a real respect for, uh, for, music, for musicians and what they do. Uh, my mother was a singer. She wanted to be a drummer. But her grandfather, who, who reared her, said, you know, drums means rock bands, and rock bands means bars, and bars mean alcohol, and you're only 14 years old, and you can't do that. <laughs> so, but she never told me that she had this um, longing until I was well into my profession. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I really appreciate her uh, restraint. So you think it, you think it was better for you that you didn't find that out till later? Yeah, I think I would. You know, I might have I done it for a different reason. Oh, you sort know, of like I think she knew that. You know, yeah. I, my mom was a really wise person. <laughs> okay, but so originally, what was it that got you into music? Was it singing? My parents. Uh, my first, my first recording, five years old. Um, because like I, I came from a, especially well, actually on both sides of my family, there were a lot of musicians, mostly amateurs, but you know they played in the bars and in the you know clubs and and such. Uh, I had a cousin Tommy who was a, a drummer and he was definitely my hero, kit player. Really. Um, but um, so they were always dabbling in different kinds of music, and so they uh, one of my cousins got a, a reel to reel tape recorder and they wanted me to hear what I sounded like on a recording. So that was my first, yeah. I mean, my um, my extended family has a lot of singers. Mm -hmm. So the singing was probably the first thing that I did. Uh, but my parents really talked up the idea of playing a musical instrument. And my mother encouraged me not to play flute, but to play drums. Why that? Why specifically that? Maybe because she had wanted to do it herself. Oh, she yeah, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but oh, I, it was endless fun. And uh, for me, it was really fortunate because I come from a, uh, a situation which is very, very rich culturally, and there's a lot of opportunity to get into trouble. So really? yeah, you know, you know, young people trouble, young people trouble. 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, instead, uh, I, I recognized very soon in life that if I told my father, listen, I want to go out and play snare drum, he was happy. And if I told him, listen, I want to go to, uh, I want to go to State Street and hang out with my friends, he wasn't quite as happy. Yeah, and okay. Because of my practice, um, schedule on snare drum with things like uh, accents and rebounds, you know, things like of that. Course. I got the bug and uh, I still have it. <laughs> accents and rebounds is one of the first books I ever learned out of because I'm, I'm a drummer. I went to the new school ah, uh, in West Village. I, love I, I, I always forget who wrote that book. Was it uh, uh, Stone? Yes, George Lawrence Stone. Okay, okay. I can't believe I pulled that out off, off of my I head. Usually, I forget those things. The, the one before accents and rebounds, but, uh, but those two books were like uh, endless. Like you could get lost for hours in in those uh, patterns, and you know, uh, it taught me to be creative. Uh, you know, taught me to see the inside. You know, I can't remember who was it who said that architecture is a study of the outside. And music is a study of the inner world. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, someone, you know, I have to figure out who that was, but it, it really hit home with me. You know, as a composer and as a, or an arranger, it really is about, I mean, you could do this in, right now I'm in a studio, which I really love. It's, you know, it's got, it's got my husband's Steinway B and my uh, Marimba One and, you know, African instruments and, and such. But um, truth be told, when I first moved to New York, my studio was about twice the size of a double bed. Oh, geez. So you and, were, you know, you were I, crammed I in there. I had a wonderful time, you know, because it was exploring. Music is exploring the inner world, not the outer world. How were your neighbors? They Like if you're playing all these percussion instruments, were they okay with it or they give you trouble? Uh, uh, my uh, The first place I moved to in New York was about a block and a half from the Manhattan School of Music. So there were a lot of musicians in the building. Unfortunately, um, we resolved it though. Um, <laughs> the gentleman below, just directly below us was studying for the bar. Oh, so he needed his focus. <laughs> he needed his focus, and I needed to focus. So it it got really tense, and we decided, all right, let's resolve this. So we went to the the board, you know, the the co-op board, and said, uh, we want to resolve this. So basically, the resolution was um, my hours were a bit restricted, which which ended up being a good thing. I'll talk about that later. But in terms of conga playing, because congas go straight through the floor, I was restricted to 20 minute, 20 minutes at a time, 20 on, 20 off, 20 on, 20 off. And it really was an actual, you know how structure makes the, the, the creative mind freer? Absolutely, it yeah. It helped me a lot because I knew I had to focus for 20 minutes because that's all I had. Mm -hmm. Then I had to do something else and then go back and focus. So it trained me in a certain way. Anyway, we, we resolved our, our, our differences. And another thing that my neighbor told me, which was interesting, he said, you know, I don't mind when you play. It's just when you hammer those things over and over again, it just, it grates on my nerve. <laughs> so uh, it really taught me to try to do my practice in a more lyrical way. So you weren't just like repeating just like basic like technical stuff over and over again? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So I don't know, you know, that could have hurt me, but I'm still smiling. <laughs> yeah. I've so did you have like the whole situation with like the egg crate foam over the apartment? Did you insulate it at all? Oh yeah, and then uh we did that, lots of carpeting things like that. Uh put uh crates and uh put foam up the congas. Mhm. Mm you know. So they so weren't just like booming throughout the floor. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And and it was a small apartment too. I think our our first apartment was about four hundred and seventy square feet. Okay, yeah, I think mine's about uh, mine's about that size right now, I think. Something like that. Maybe like five something. I'm not totally sure. I forgot yeah. in all honesty. You know, it's, <clears throat> again, it's the inner world, you know? That's what street the, wait, you said it's up near Manhattan School of Music. What is that like? I actually don't know. Is that like eightieth Street? Something I know, like that? Uh, the current Manhattan School of Music is on hundred and twenty second and Broadway. Damn, I was 40 streets off. Okay, my New York knowledge is, is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not to worry. You know, the first Manhattan School of Music was, oh, no, 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 wrong. The, uh, the Juilliard School of Music was in the building where the Manhattan School of Music is now. 
Oh, okay. There's a lot of schools up really up far in Manhattan. Like, uh, like I said, I went to the new school and I a went ton. to the jet. Yeah, I went to the I went to the jazz school, uh, and that was connected to it, it's now connected to Manus, which is the classical school, and that was up uh, like 140th Street or something like that. So for some reason, the music schools were always up there. I'm not sure why. There's a lot of schools in my neighborhood, in my old neighborhood. Um, Union Theological Ser Seminary, Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, Columbia University. We were, our building was like a donut hole in Columbia University. So um, our musician friends uh, referred to us as the affluent poor. Because <laughs> we walked out the door and the architecture was glorious and there were always outdoor concerts and great things going on. Didn't have a lot of money in those days, but uh, life was really, really sweet. That's the nice thing about New York. If you can pay the rent, and you know you can have a fun time here without actually having to spend a ton of money just walking around here is nice you know you can go to cool areas and as, as long as you can cover your food and your rent you can have a, a pretty nice life especially in the summertime yes with all oh, the concerts and absolutely you know, events, uh, theatrical situations it's just amazing yeah it's uh it's my girlfriend and i are trying to go see shakespeare in the park and i've never, i haven't seen that yet but i've always wanted to and now that everything's reopened i'm really i'm interested in seeing that Oh, it's fantastic. It's really? really? It's really great. And, you know, I got bit by the bug. Lee Howard Stevens went to the University of Oklahoma, where I had transferred from, the University mm -hmm. of Colorado. And uh, when I heard Lee play, I said, whoa, this artist is on to something, you know, um, cutting it. So, you know, I asked him at the end of a week of residency, you know, how, how could I continue to study with you? And he said, well, you know, I, I teach out of my apartment on uh, West End Avenue in Manhattan. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going. And uh, when I went for a 10 day visit, uh, well, I tried to practice a lot, <laughs> you know, it was a serious, a serious endeavor, but I tried to sandwich in as much cultural activity as I could, you know, walking around Central Park, uh, exploring some of the great places in New York. And I happened upon the loft scene. I don't know how I bumped into the loft scene and it was Verna Gillis's soundscape. And I remember it was three Brazilian artists. They were coming from their formal gigs and they were, you know, whoever just showed up, I think you paid like $2, got a glass of wine, whoever showed up, there was no agenda. Just, just do, just do whatever you want. Out, have a good time, explore music and, and be. That's when New York is at its absolute best is stuff like that. It's true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, when I saw that, I said, this is Mecca. I am moving to New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy you did. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's the, it's for music. It really is un. I don't think it's really rivaled. I mean, I know Nashville has such as a scene and LA has a studio scene, but for that, like actual, just live spontaneous stuff, I don't think you can really beat New York to be fully honest. I can't say, but, uh, you know, all the cities that I, that I remember, New York is, is unique in terms of art, culture, visual art, performing art. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. So wait, going back when your mom says she didn't want, she, she'd rather you play the drums over the flute. How old were you at that point? Nine. Nine. Okay. And then, so that's after you make that recording of you singing. So now the music is really starting to, to become a passion. When is it that you really start focusing like hard on a specific instrument? Was there a specific instrument, like in terms of percussion that you were really into at that time? Um, as a kid, because, uh, frankly, our, uh, our, Middle school didn't have a lot of instruments. Mm -hmm. I really focused on snare drumming. Okay. Really, really loved it. And uh, I had two band directors who were snare drum who were great drummers. I'm kit drummers as well, but they they loved snare drumming and and they instilled that love in me. So I really got the whole rudimental training, you know how to how to use the one hand to the other. And and uh, I think it's been uh, a fortunate thing for me. From there, I went to. Uh, there was a teacher's college uh, in my hometown called Adams State. It's now a university, but it was a teacher's college back then that had a small music department. And the percussion majors used to practice in the band room, everybody playing at the same time. 
<laughs> when I first saw that, I said, number one, why are you guys doing this? Yeah, that must have been miserable <laughs> to listen to. How can you concentrate on what you're doing? Yeah. And um, the wonderful Vicki Eckler, who became my uh, private teacher, said, well, you know, it's just a matter of what you focus on. If you focus on what you're doing, you can accomplish what you're doing. It doesn't matter what the distractions might be. That statement really served me well. I don't know if and I could do so that, I honestly. To, yeah, I began to really, you know, I joined the I joined the crew as a high schooler. Mm -hmm. And they really welcomed me, which I really am so grateful for. Uh, one thing that really impressed me about the percussion ensemble, which I joined at Adam State, there were two keyboard players, vibraphones and vibraphone and marimba, who were uh, jazz pianists because they didn't have enough percussion majors. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, you guys know the keyboard, so you just play vibes and marimba. They never missed notes. I'm like, you know, when I'm practicing my stuff, I'm like, you know, hitting a clam here and there. But they are not, they are not missing notes. What is going on? And it wasn't really until I met my husband, Barry Olson, that I realized why they weren't missing notes. It's because the harmonies were instilled, the voicings of particular harmonies are instilled from the beginning of learning the jazz language. So they didn't have to think about it at all. It was just, it was yeah. just uh, motor memory or was it muscle memory? Yes. You know, that, you know, that F minor seven sharp nine looks like this or this or this or this or this. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other like major passions around that time or were you all on all like all in on, on being a, a drummer? Um, I was pretty all in on being a drummer. I'm a hopeless uh, mountaineer. <laughs> you know, I don't do these like three day hikes because I'm too lazy. I, I, at the moment I live in the mountains, so I just mm -hmm. have to walk out my back door. But, um, back then I was uh, in the San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado and I had to jump on my bike and ride for about an hour to get to the, the actual, um, San Juan mountains. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, I really love being, you know, in nature. Um, but I really loved drumming. I, I just felt um, somehow that there was a future in it. Mm -hmm. And I was always passionate about it. And, you know, having your parents' support, I think, it, for me, I'm so grateful because uh, they felt like being a musician is something very special. So that, that was really good for me. You know, Were you I was working a lot? Uh, not in, not so much in, in university or, or, uh, you know, I did some, some gigs, but, um, you realize by the time I started gigging, I was living on the other side of the country from my family. Mm -hmm. So, so when you were, when you were back home, it was mostly just studying. Um, yeah, studying, uh, going back home. Well, you know, after, you know, after moving to New York, going back home meant, giving clinics and things like that, at, you know, kind of giving back to that local college. Oh, yeah. No, I meant I meant like when you were first living there, it was mostly just you trying to get your, your chops up. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I left. Uh, well, I left Colorado. I left Southern Colorado when I was just about to turn 17. And that's was that to go to University Colorado, of Colorado? I was just about to turn 18. Oh, OK. And then I, I moved to New York. Uh, about three and a half years later. Okay, what so was I was that? in our early twenties when I moved to New York. Okay, so you were you were young when you came to the city. Yeah. Okay, I mean that's you, a, that's a, that's. You know, a, when we're in our early twenties. We think we know everything. Exactly. <laughs> like I'm going to move to the city. I'm going to make it. Was, ignorance was bliss at the time. You know, I <laughs> I met my husband Barry. Um, we had a musical community in our building because it was close. You know, like a, as I said, there were a lot of. Um, uh, musicians in the building and and really well thoughtful and educated people you know i really became i was very fortunate to find a community that i found at the age of 22. absolutely and besides that guy but but like below you in your apartment it's, it's a pretty good situation to have one person in your place that's upset with you because in new york you never know you could have everyone on above you and the left and the right have problems with you so that's that's pretty fortunate actually it really was. There were musicians on the board and they, they were, you know, they were saying, no, <laughs> take her rights away. I'm taking my rights away as well. So uh, we were a great community. Yeah. And you know, it really, because Barry was in the Latin scene and was always gigging, Barry used to gig 
six days a week, sometimes seven. You know, I just grew uh, as a young professional. I just said, you know, I have to always be gigging. I used to make my own gigs. I, I remember going to the uh, Greenwich House School of Music and saying, um, I would like to give a recital. I'll give it to you for free. I would just you sell tickets to perform and they were oh of course naturally so they opened it was it was so advantageous and you know at the time um which was between undergrad and grad school mm -hmm. uh, i used to I, I played five nights a week at an italian restaurant i i don't know it was you know lady fortune was smiling on me i went to find a waitress job and i ended up taking the marimba that evening and and playing monday through friday evenings where was it what restaurant uh, it was called Foro Italico on 34th Street. It's about a block and a half east of the Javits Center, which didn't exist at the time. Okay, so it's over on the on the west side. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Um, wait, so when you're in set me up for just knowing that I could gig in New York City. I mean, that's fantastic. That's the best feeling in the whole world is getting a gig here. Yeah. So wait, when you were in high school. What was it that made you say, like, specifically, I want to go to the University of Colorado? Did you just want to stay in, in your home state? Or was there a specific, like, reason that, that brought you there? I wanted to kind of get away a bit. You know, the University of Colorado in Boulder is half the state away, a big state, away from Southern Colorado. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a decent distance in between. Two schools, the University of Colorado and the University of Oklahoma. Did you have one that you wanted more? Well, no, I, I, I just didn't. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> you know, I, I knew that I'd probably get a decent education. Uh, and I did. I mean, in, at, at, at CU, uh, John Gom was teaching. Mm -hmm. John Gom is my hero. Really? He could, he could lecture about classical, uh, you know, the history of music in this, with the same passion that he could play salsa. Okay. You know, so and he, he was... was really somewhat of a world music or world percussion star before the term world percussion was used or world music. Okay. And he was my hero. Um, unfortunately, he was everybody else's hero too. So we didn't really have a lot of studio time with John. And I kind of thought, you know, maybe I should go for a more complete education. So don't tell me, don't ask me why, but I decided to transfer. And what this afforded me going to the University of Oklahoma was, uh, I switched my major from performance to education. I said, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good things going on with an education degree. One of them is you study cello with the cello teacher, you study piano with the piano teacher, you study voice with a voice teacher. Um, and it really, um, I think it really set me up to have a better understanding of the bigger picture of music. Okay. Cause then you could see, you could see it through the eyes of someone who would, who would have to teach it. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I studied, uh, trombone was, you know, rather than taking lab classes, I actually studied like a major. Okay. And I really wanted to. Yeah, I had in the back of my head, you know, I, you can always teach, mm -hmm. which is not really true. That is, yeah, that, that's true. That's not necessarily the case. That's not necessarily true. But um, what I had in mind was just really uh, studying a lot of orchestration, a lot of um, arranging, studying vocal arranging, those kind of things. And in my uh, Colorado University performance degree, it was really about percussion. Mm -hmm. I got some amazing things from CU. Uh, reading. We had reading class. It was intense. We used to read, read string quartets. You what know, year did I, you transfer? I transferred uh, my second year from, from freshman to sophomore. Okay. And then did you, and you finished out at, at Oklahoma? I finished out with, with a double major in vocal and instrumental. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Were you kind of just coasting That's through amazing. it, just having a good time? Yeah, I had amazing teachers, really okay. amazing, caring teachers. And uh, one of those was uh, Richard Gibson, who had a, a whole bunch of people through the studio, Lee Howard Stevens, Karen Irvin, uh, Gordon Stout, and, and many others, uh, Ed Sof, you know, and, and, and so it just gave me a taste of what it's like to be the creme de la creme, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 
what did you do right after college? Did you go straight to New York? Is that, I can't I remember did. if you said you went straight from New York. I did. Okay. I went to New York. I took my first lesson. I met my husband 12 hours after I moved into my apartment building. Re Wait, where'd uh, you meet? In, in my roommate's apartment, which was in the building. Oh, so you lived in the same... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we live in a different place now. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, of course. I've been there for many years. It Wait, was so a great community. It was a great place to be. How long um, after moving to New York did you go to Ghana? Let's see. Six years. Okay. And so, so, you, so you... As a freshman, I learned about the GEAL. Mm -hmm. In graduate school with Gordon Stout at Ithaca College. Um, and Gordon's another hero of mine. Just such a, he, he really, you know, like the big bird took me under his wing and said, you know, I think he felt what I needed is a big dose of self-confidence. Those kind of people are the absolute best. Aren't they? Aren't they? Cause I thought the whole, Oh, conservative art music. And this is the East. And I was like, ah. mm -hmm. and he said, nah, you know, you're going to be fine. I, I had some amazing instructors like that. Like uh, I took drum lessons from a drummer named Amir Zeev, and I was in classes with a guitarist uh, named Richard Bukas, and he was always the guy who would he he played on uh, uh, In the Heights, and he's and he's on Chicago. Uh, I, I can't remember if he was fully on Chicago or if he subbed for Chicago. He's in the Broadway stuff, but his main thing is Brazilian music, and he was always the guy that like after I'd play something and I'd be like, ah man, that sound terrible. I shouldn't be here. He was the one who would always you know hype me back up and say like, no no no, that this was great. Maybe not this one, but you can do it like this. And he was always the person that kind of gave me that like like I said took took me took me under his wing and uh helped me through those times where i felt like you know quitting and saying eh, i don't need to be here i should go somewhere else yeah I, it's we need people like that and we have Absolutely. to be people like that you know after we i mean that's what i try to do you know at, at new york university is just try to keep hope alive Absolutely. So, so so you were saying about after ithaca college or ithaca college is where you got uh interested in the geal and then from uh, there, no, actually, um, from from my from freshman days, we had a, a doctoral student, a clarinetist, actually from Ghana. Okay. He would walk up to a marimba, you know, the four and a third musser, <laughs> and his, I'll tell you, this man played. His concept was like nothing I'd heard, like no jazz player, like no classical player, and I I I finally asked him, like, where where do you get this from? And he told me about the geal. Okay. And the Geely art. And, and I, that sparked my interest. In graduate school, we had what was called bibliography of music that was required of all performance majors. And basically what, what bibliography does is try, it, it gets you in all of the resources um, to do research about your instruments so that, so that as a graduate, you can educate an audience in a mm -hmm. clinic situation or whatever it might be. I chose Geel. And I realized there wasn't very much scholarship. So that was a problem, you know, mm -hmm. and when I, when I did graduate and move back uh, to New York City, um, I got to tell you the Lincoln Center Library of the Performing Arts, I probably went there three or four times a week. I checked out all the recordings, did as much research as I could. I did find a lot of recorded music, but I didn't find a lot of research. So eventually I said, you know, I'm going to have to go. Mm-hmm. It's the farthest so, thing away from my mind. Go to Ghana and plant myself there and say, hi, can you tell me about the Geel? So but it, it ended up being very to? fortuitous. Who do you talk to to go do that? Do you just say, are, are you married at that time? Yes. Okay, so you just say to your, did your husband come with you? No, he almost did. Really? Uh, I was sobbing. I wasn't just, I was literally sobbing on the uh -huh. way to the airport. Oh, geez. What if this? What if that? And he literally told me, look, I could I could join you if you want. I said, no, I have to do this by myself. Um, what I had done was heard Kakraba Lobi, who is the founding jail master of the National Dance Company of Ghana. When I heard that record, I said, because when I was a child, or a little, when I was younger, Parliament Funkadelic, Earth, Wind, and Fire, yeah. Power of Power, uh, Santana, mm -hmm. and an, uh, a West African rock group call, called Osibisa, or okay. it's also pronounced Osi uh, Osibisa. I don't know them. Um, they were, you know, a moderately successful group. And I also, my, my father used to take us, um, the family, the, my nuclear family, 
around to different native nations uh, all throughout the Southwest because mm -hmm. he wanted me to know my Native American roots. And we went to Mexico, in northern Mexico, and I heard marimba probably before I ever heard a classical marimba, I heard a Mexican marimba. And my impression was, man, the timbre of this instrument is so funky. It's so cool. But I wasn't so attracted to the music. Mm -hmm. So I found myself saying, gee, I wonder if what the marimba would sound like if it played Parliament Funkadelic. When I heard Kakrava Lobi, I realized not only had someone done, made this discovery, but it wasn't the marimba playing like Parliament Funkadelic. It's Parliament Funkadelic playing like the traditional ancient Gio. That's what oh, okay. we call funk. You know, okay. R &B, blues shuffle, gospel music. It comes mm -hmm. from this tradition. And so how did you finally make that just like, you know, you, you were thinking about going, final decision, you know what, screw it. I'm just moving there and I'm, I'm just going to go. And how long were you, were you there total? Um, the first time I was there for three weeks and three days, and I told I had heard stories. I, of course, I wanted everyone's stories. Anybody who had ever been to West Africa, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. um, one woman had been. Uh, she was she was riding in a what they call a trotro, which is kind of private transportation, but in a la public transportation that you pay, and you ride with strangers. Um, they had been held up at gunpoint which oh, was actually geez. quite rare in Ghana. Okay. Okay, someone else had a severe malaria. So you're so, basically only hearing the bad stories. Exactly. I was hearing <laughs> the, be careful, don't get sick. Be careful, there's no infrastructure. Be careful. So I almost didn't go. And I, I finally said, like you said, screw it. I'm going. Three mm -hmm. weeks and three days. I said, all right, let's just do this. And um, fortunately, for, fortunately for me, I was in the exact right line to take the public bus from Southern Ghana to the Upper West, which is where the Jeel is from. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of about 15, 20 people who were officiating a Jeel festival called Kobine. So when I, when I walked up to a gentleman who had a Jeel on his t-shirt, I said, yo, you must, You're like Zildjian, right? You see uh -huh. Zildjian. <laughs> Jill on his t-shirt. Yo, man, are you, are you a Jill player? He said, no, 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 no. I said, but look, you're, you're wearing a t-shirt with the, with the instrument. Oh, this is a mascot of my region. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am onto something. Cause I really didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. He said, ah, oh, are you interested in, in this? I said, yeah, I really am. Let me introduce you to the director of education. He is going on this bus. So I go to him introduce right myself he says oh fantastic let me introduce you to the director of the regional arts council of this region who's on this bus walk me over there and he said wow how did you hear about Kobine festival i said koba what <laughs> our festival don't you understand we're all going to Kobine festival i said oh wow i didn't realize that so it's just all happenstance that this is going like, on. You can go over look like. <laughs> I thought I was lying. Really? I had to convince him I wasn't lying. I really didn't know what I was doing. I said, I just have a notion that the instrument is from here. He said, young lady, you are on the bus to Kobine. I said, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So what ha what ended up happening? Kobine is a three week, three day and three night long. Three days and three, three days, two full nights and one half night mm -hmm. long festival of the Jeel. I got to meet dozens of players, people who dance to the music, people who tell the stories. And uh, the most important thing for me is I had three teachers at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about hospitality, because there's there's something in 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 Ghana, especially tremendous hospitality, tremendous. Mm -hmm. Like we don't even know what the word hospitality means in America. Okay. Hospitality, like you're coming to learn about us. Here, sit here, eat this. Here's the teacher, and of course, you know, I, it was my duty to 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 repay as much as I could. But I really, you know, I found myself thinking, like, how can I really repay 
you know, I'm going to leave some money. Ah, so what? Mm -hmm. But um, what ended up happening is after three days of instruction, my main teacher named Nevin Baru took me to see the chief. And, you know, you, you know how when you have your piano, uh, like your little piano recital when you're 10 years old? That's how I felt because I just learned these pieces. I felt like a little kid at a recital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, okay, well, this this seems like a cool thing. So we played. I played and, and Baru drummed for me and Richard Naile played the bell for me. And I played two or three simple tunes. And the chief got up and danced. He was with his council of elders who were all men in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're really the, the real uh, democratic government of the village. He got up and danced. Well, I didn't realize it, but chiefs are not supposed to dance. They're supposed to sit and officiate. So when he got up and danced, the other uh, gentlemen were a little bit disturbed. Like, what is he trying to say? Mm -hmm. I sat down and a big debate broke out in the Dagara language, which is the language of Laura. And at that, that time, w women weren't allowed to perform that instrument publicly, right? That's what they were arguing about. They okay. were saying, number one. It is our tradition that when strangers, they call us a visitor stranger in mm -hmm. English. When strangers come, you honor them because they're making connections. Mm -hmm. But number two, we don't play the jill. Geely art is not for women. It's for men. So they were, they were going back and forth and back and forth. Finally, the chief got up. He was wearing this purple robe for that occasion. He throws up his robe and he says, from no one. In English, too, so that I would know. Women will play the jil. Just from that? Yeah, and I just, then I realized what they were arguing about. <gasps> Holy smokes. Oh, my gosh. I'm not supposed to be playing this. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. But, um, so then the festival commenced about a day and a half later, and they asked me to play on the program. Mm-hmm. And uh, people, not everybody was happy, I have to tell you. Some of the people were saying, ah, oh, you Westerners, you come and break our traditions. Mm -hmm. But most people were coming up to me. Of course, I don't know what they were saying to each other. But they were coming up to me and saying, this is great. You know, our women, they need to know that they can do things. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, it took me a little while to garner like a couple of years going there every year to garner the courage to have a really long discussion with Chief Carbo. Like, Chief, what were you thinking? What was in your mind when you made this decree? So he told me a story. He said, uh, I was schooled in London. I'm actually an attorney as well as a chief. And my parents had the means to, for me to experience Western life in London, you know, in the UK. Mm -hmm. He said, I, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, in London, I saw that women participate in society, just like men. They go to work, they own businesses, they, um, you know, they have jobs at all different levels. And he said, you know, the economy, this causes the economy to thrive and it causes people to be more egalitarian. I wanted my women in, meaning his subjects, um, to have that opportunity. So he told me, when you came along, you're a woman, you're playing the jill. This is a perfect opportunity for me to teach something to the women of Laura. Wow. So I, I kind of felt like, wow, I hope I could give something back. Mm -hmm. You know, because you always feel better when, isn't it true? Of course. When you're, when you're, when you're in a gig and, and somebody's giving you such great music and you can give it back, it's mm -hmm. always better to give back. Yeah. That's, that's just amazing that it such a switch so quickly. You know, there was no rallying. It was just, now it's just different forever. That's what chiefs, that's the power that chiefs have. And um, I have to say it's, it's a humbling power because uh, the chiefs that I have seen in West African villages really take it on as a, as a responsibility, mm -hmm. not a power trip. Okay. You know, they're really thinking about what is it that I can do for the health and well-being of as many people as possible in this village. Okay. Well, who is it that comes to you? Because they ended up making a documentary about this, right? Yes, it's called Knock on Wood, the film. Okay. When did, when did they start filming that? Like, what year was this? 
oh gosh it wasn't that um and it was footage you know they edited footage mm -hmm. uh goodness i can't remember but it was much more recently okay but, uh, through through you know document documentary um his name is ron grunhut um filmmakers just are, are so great at the art of retelling a story yeah and so he found the story to tell and i'm grateful for that how do you think the experience was because you've had you know a collegiate uh, education in america and then you're learning in west africa how different is the approach to learning in in each place and where do you think that maybe the pitfalls are in one uh versus you know the positives in the other hmm. i think most of my teachers in the west are are and were linear first it's the stroke then let's look at the sound then let's look at the page. Then what's at the top left of the page? And that's all fine. In West Africa, it's the whole, you eat the whole fish. So, In other words, um, say I'm playing a line. I'm not set up to perform, but uh, sorry, I'm off camera. But no, it's okay. That's with one hand. Wow. So you hear that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And if I, if you're not careful and you've been, you've had a Western education, you say, Oh, I've heard a lot of Westerners say this. Oh, they don't know how to teach. No, not true. They know how to teach. But the most important thing about teaching is providing the entire thing and then inviting you to enter wherever you feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. So my first lessons with Newen Baru were doing these very complicated left lines and he would, um, I remember him, him playing a complicated left line and he said, you got it? You got yeah. it? Yeah, 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 I'm ready. Okay, you play it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I play it? But how does it start? He played the whole line. You got it? Then I realized, ah, this is, I have to really observe with my entire attention. That must have really affected the way you, I mean, the live, you live the rest of your life being forced to learn something so quickly, right? Uh, I think so. And you know, it's really not a matter of quick. It's a matter of thorough. Mm -hmm. That you're looking at every single possible, you're not just, you're, you have to look at everything and get the, the big picture and you're not just, you can't just ignore little things. Yeah, and that's that's the wonderful art, and you know that's the jazz art mm -hmm. is getting the the whole picture. Uh, and one thing that was really a big eye opener for me when I first went to Ghana up to up to Laura up the upper up the upper west, um, they gave me an instrument and a seat, you know, and a cup of tea, and and time to practice. The children would come and sit. And at first I thought, oh, this is, this is cute. This is kind of cool. This will, this will, they're going to get tired of this in like 10 minutes. They're going to wander <laughs> off. They didn't. They didn't wow. wander off. They would sit there in total silence and watch. I think they were really, uh, they were kind of amused because, you know, I was this kind of, you know, you know, Native American girl, like, you know, from the other side of the world, and I was learning their music. Mm -hmm. But they realized from their standpoint that they could learn a lot from watching me struggle you know what they call one one mm -hmm. you know <laughs> that's the phrase they use oh that one plays fine that one plays one one in other words they someone who picks everything apart oh kind of like typing on a keyboard like that sort of a situation well, it's, like it's kind of like okay beat one is this uh-huh beat two is that they don't learn and teach that way. Yeah. These children would sit, you know, and the first, okay, so now we're talking about practice room ethic, right? When you go to university, you shut yourself in the practice room. Nobody really hears you unless they put their ear to the door, right? Mm -hmm. Unless uh, they're the people in your high school in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> With all the snare drummers in one room. We have to ignore each other. But um, so these kids were just sitting there. And I suddenly felt pretty embarrassed. I'm like, Oh, my goodness, I'm not doing nearly as well as a traditional player. 
But I thought, okay, I'll just hang with this. You know, it. I am the guest. They are the host. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to impose any of my, um, the way I see the world. You know, I'm here to learn. I'm not here to teach anything. So I just watched and I, I continued to practice. I put my malice down to go refill my cup of tea. And what I saw blew my mind. The kids were racing like musical chairs to sit in my seat so they could demonstrate to each other what they had learned simply by observing. That must have and felt you know, outstanding. Amazing. Uh, not only at that moment, but you see kids who are eight years old who play like you just can't mm -hmm. imagine because they observe. They are taught from, from birth to observe and absorb. And they can just pick that stuff up naturally. There's oh, no, they, they just amazing. get it. It's really amazing. What was the longest time that you ever stayed? Did you fully ever live in Ghana or was it always just kind of shorter visits? It was always uh, summer. Okay. Because I was off. And it was uh, anywhere, I think that three, and, three week and three days was the shortest. Uh, I've been there as long as two months. What was the first, like what year is it when you first went there? 1988. Okay, so that this is still before SNL. Yes, it's about a, like a decade before SNL, I think, right? Yeah, or like eight years, SNL. something like that. Yeah, I, I joined SNL in '95. How'd so you get that job? The trajectory is like this. <laughs> um, I'll try to make it short. Uh, no, go one, as long, go as long as you need. <laughs> we have all the time in the world. I uh, one day I went out to busk uh, in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and for some reason. You know, I always like to follow my instincts. My mother taught me that. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't really happening that much. It was kind of funky weather. I said, you know, I'm going to go on the Lower East Side. So I, I actually packed up my marimba, drove down to the Lower East Side, set up in front of a church. And uh, the scene was amazing. People were actually like, oh, man, this is cool. This is cool. One old woman came out and said, you should not be playing in front of a church. And so I had to move. Okay, so... Uh, someone came, they drove by in a car, a woman ran out and said, oh, my name is Consuelo, we need a marimba player, here's a production, oh, you know, give me your card. So from that, I joined the Latin American Workshop, and I became a member of their house band, which is the Latin American Workshop. They teach language, visual art, um, music, dance. It's a cultural institution. Um, so in the house band, if someone was there and they were sponsored and they could pay you a thousand dollars to do a performance, you would smile and play the performance. If someone came, they had no money and they had, you, you couldn't get paid for the performance, you'd smile and play the performance. You know, that's what the house band did. Um, so one of, uh, one of our artists was uh, sponsored by Philip Glass. So oh, yeah. Philip was in the audience. Two days later, I get a call from his production company. Philip is making a new record, and he would like you to audition. So I went into the studio. What they basically what they wanted to know is if I could follow a click track and if I could read. So I stay, I spent about eight minutes there, and they they gave me the next rehearsal date. So I played with the Philip Glass Ensemble, and mm -hmm. while I was reporting, I met Roger Squituro, who's a really amazing, beautiful percussionist. Roger was in Lenny Pickett's band. And Roger uh, actually told Lenny about my, you know, activities and what I was up to. Lenny Wait, was he I, in Lenny's like that? Because Lenny had that that horn, uh, like was it a trio or quartet? I can't remember. Jeez, he was on the show. Uh, I can't. Borneo horns was Borneo a, horns, yeah. I think. And so uh, what 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 ended up happening is Lenny and I met at Drummer's World. Ah. Uh. Uh, and you know, I I said, oh, this is a legendary musician, and he kind of looked at me like. And what he actually said was, oh, we were just talking about you. We looked for your name in the union book, but I guess you aren't in the union, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I joined like the next day, I think. <laughs> but he said, we were looking, uh, my, my band, the extended Borneo Horns, like mm -hmm. everybody was a multi-instrumentalist. Yeah. Um, he said, we were looking for somebody who could play both percussion and four mallet xylophone in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I was just trying to figure out how to, how to find you. And you just walked in. 
Um, imagine yeah. if that didn't happen. Just like that little little thing that happens, you just run into him. Isn't it amazing how things happen? That's insane. So I, I played with this band. I, he said, uh, and it was so funny. He said, I, I have a gig coming up in Frankfurt for the Mesa, the Frankfurt Fair. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a PASIC of all instruments. Okay. Um, and he said, uh, I remember him saying, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, it, it only pays $650. That was a windfall for me at the time. So I said, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'd be happy to do it. And um, so that's how I joined his extended Borneo horn band and played with him for a long, for quite a while. Um, and then I subbed out, I couldn't do a particular long run in Virginia. And I subbed out to Bill Ware, who's an amazing improviser, amazing vibraphonist. And I kind of thought, Oh, I never heard from Lenny again. I said, ah, drat. I subbed out my gig. Cause literally I have so much respect for Bill. You know, he's, he's a fantastic improviser, fantastic player. So I didn't hear from Lenny. The next thing I heard was on my answering machine. Um, hi, this is Lenny Pickett. How are you guys doing? Uh, somehow he'd met Barry and, you know, he said, how are you guys doing? Uh, Valerie, all summer long, we've been considering you for the, for the SNL band because we want to add a percussion chair. Uh, Barry, if Valerie is on tour, if she's, if she's not around, can you call me back and let me know? Because if she's not around, we have to pass. We have to make this decision quickly. I was around, but I'd been fired from a band. And if I had been on tour with that band, I would have missed SNL. Oh my God. That's... Yeah. So it was just, to me, it was like, and that whole summer, he said, you know, he later told me, they were struggling, you know, because the cut, their SNL budget was cut. Oh yeah. Year. That was, that was around that time I where know. their budget was really low. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the line manager were saying, you can't add a musician, you know, the budget is cut. And, and they were saying, no, we have to add a percussion. It's going to really add a lot. You know, we have somebody in mind. Um, so they were struggling with that notion, mm-hmm. add them or don't add them, call her or don't call her. I had been struggling with being fired from a band and my self identity. Mm-hmm. Am I too am I too tall, too short, too young, too old, too dark, too light? You know, I'm like I wasn't looking at my own art as as what it is, something mm-hmm. unique. I was just saying, man, I don't fit this, that, and the other, and really trying to overcome a real um, hurdle in my own emotional maturity. You know, I felt like, yeah, I was kind of a mid-career percussionist. And, you know, I, I had explored a few things. I'd been to Ghana many, many times. And I I think by that time had been to South Africa. And li- actually lived in South Africa in 1994. Okay. Um, so I was struggling. I was struggling. And I was really into my, in my Buddhist practice. Like, man, if I feel funky... I better climb out now because it's about me. It's not about anybody around me. And one day I remember going down to my practice room, my, my studio, which was, we lived in a tenement building, that same building we were talking about on the fourth floor. And we had, uh, our studio was on the first floor. I remember going down the stairwell and thinking, you know, everything's okay. I'm okay. I don't need to stress about this. I am exactly where I need to be right now. And I felt it, you know, in my heart, Mm -hmm. like I can chill. I can just go down and practice and just feel happy. And that's that evening I got that call. So, you know what I learned? What's inside is reflected on the outside. And I never turned back from that idea. So whenever I start to think negative, I think of, uh, of the historical Bodhisattva Fukio, who's a, who was a, like a, a, a wise sage who never, disparage anybody i mean think about it that's you know, hard hits you with an egg because they hate you or or they wreck your car you don't say Brah! you know here's a person who never spoke poorly about anyone and i said you know what that's the way to go and in music it really is the way to go because you know you're you're always um 
you're always on display as a musician. You know, your innermost self and your outermost self are, are always out there. Yeah. And it's important to know that whatever, what's, what's in your heart is going to be out on stage, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Lenny, it seems like Lenny has a similar kind of frame of mind of not, you know, burning any bridges and trying to be as, as professional as, and, and as nice as possible. Just from the little bits that I've been able to talk to him, it seems like he has sort of that, that kind of vibe to him. He is really amazing. Um, he really, uh, he's so dedicated to people. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of my heroes for sure. I mean, besides being a stellar player, he's just so, um, he is such a caring individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel so fortunate to be in that band. I mean. I just can't yeah. believe all the t all of the different ways that if something went differently, how you wouldn't have ended up there. It's just like, you know, it's usually like one thing goes and you go, oh, if this one thing didn't happen, then maybe I wouldn't have gotten that call. But just like the running into him and then you getting, you know, let go from the band right before he calls you. That's just, it's like, that's, it's almost unbelievable how, how perfect that had to be. And if one thing veered off, it could have been completely different. Well, you know, life has perfection. Yeah. When the sun rises, hey, it's like a beautiful thing. There's no glitches, you know. <laughs> the sun doesn't say, "Oh man, I forgot my I forgot my backpack. Let me go back." You know, yeah, it's a perfect thing. And so, um, I think you know my my life, especially my young life, especially in my twenties, because believe me, I was full of angst. I was probably the most angst-ridden graduate student in the entire universe. That's where you know, I am I, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think graduate school is supposed to make you feel A N G S T H whatever <laughs> angst. But um, you know, my twenties was a journey about uh, revealing who I am and being comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully put. I said it's amazing. Valid. Well, I, I remember going. Uh, I got hired, and one thing that, that reminded me of this just right now. Um, I got hired. Give me just one second, please. You okay? Take your time. Thank you. I'm just hanging. Hope everyone in the audience is doing well. Ian Miller, what's up? <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm saying uh, hi to the people in the in the chat. <laughs> thank all of you. I'm not on the chat, but thank you for being here. Um, really, really appreciate it. I I started getting hired by you know certain concerns, and they said, "Oh, you're a woman." year of color, this and that. And I got hired to do a vibes gig, a serious jazz vibes gig. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was very idealistic. And, you know, I did do a Latin jazz gig with a group called Carabali and I loved it. It was oh, such a wonderful thing for me. But, you know, serious giant steps kind of jazz. I took the gig. It was, I failed miserably. And, you know, I sat down with myself and said, you know, I think it's time to know what I can do mm -hmm. and what I can't do. And just to say what I would have done if I had done that gig over is to say, no, I can't do this gig, but I can refer someone else. So it was a big learning thing for me. You know, it's just to know what is it that I have to give and what is it that some of my comrades or someone else has to give that I can it, make a connection. Because at the, at the end of the day, it almost it shows that you're smarter than just being able to do everything. It, 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 it's, it's more educated to say, you know, I can't do this. This is something I know someone who can do this really well, but I'm going to be honest and say like, you know, I'm not just going to try to like bull crap my way through it. I'm going to say, you know, I'm, I know my skills enough and I offer this and this is just something that I, I happen to not offer as well as someone that I might know. Mm. This happened really recently. Someone called me to do a Mexican marimba arrangement and I said, I could probably, you know, I, I know something about Mexican marimba, but Larry Captain has devoted his whole life to this. Tell you what, you know, you should call Larry Captain. And, I, and they did. I think it was with Joan Baez. Oh, and really? I, something in my mind said, oh, I love Joan Baez. Mm -hmm. Larry should do this gig. Plus it makes, it, it just, it gives people like a, 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 a perspective of you that's just, they can trust you. They know that you're not just going to, shove yourself into a situation that you're going to you care more about their production than you do about just necessarily like your own gain 
Well, you know, it's funny because as a musician, you know, we really are serving the community. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when, now. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and sometimes the best way to serve the community is is to bring people together. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what great pro producers and um, event managers do. We really and we really need them. Absolutely. Because you know, me, I mean, yeah, I can barely keep my, uh, you know, my 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 inbox to my email straight, much less <laughs> you know plan events. But you know, if you tell me about an event, uh, I will start thinking about the music. I'll start planning it. Maybe I'll start writing some new music. Uh, we we did something earlier today for a, a wonderful group called uh, Remote Daily, mm -hmm. and uh, the the curator called Barry up, my husband, and said, "Can the two of you do something?" And I thought, "Oh, that's cool. That's great." Now you would think, you know, we've played for years together. You'd think we just sit down and play together all the time. We don't. I mean, we do it we occasionally, but actually we sitting down and putting something together. Um, Barry had this beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous piece in 14.8. Okay. I don't really play odd times that well. Okay. And for me, this curator took my husband, wrapped him in a bow, and gave him to me in a different way. You know, and, and I have a real big appreciation for people who plan festivals, who own clubs, you know, they do a wonderful service to humanity. And it's not an easy job either. No, it's definitely no. not. Especially now, I'm just so happy to see that the clubs are coming back and they can actually make some money finally, you know. I'm saying I'm I'm we we lost a, a a couple great places, but overall I think New York they they we took a hit with a stride because a lot of places are are, you know, still here and they're opening back up and they're and they're already killing it. So that's fantastic to see. Yeah, something about New York, something about a New Yorker, you know, we can take it. They can take a, they, remember, they can take a punch. Uh, I remember uh, 2001, September. Yeah. Um, how, how crazy it was, how amazing, but how New Yorkers pulled together and, and we took the hit. Yeah. We, took, we were able to do it. It's hard. I mean, New York is just, it's just a hardy city. The people here are crazy. I still have six years before I think I can really say, I think you have to say, stay here 10 years before you can call yourself a New Yorker. I have, yes. I have, I've only been here four, so I have to. I have to take oh, six those more. Will fly. <laughs> yeah, if I can afford, if I can afford to be here, then yes, they will fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you all all the best because uh, New York is a wonderful, a wonderful city. It's a wonderful city in and of itself, and it's a wonderful city to be based out of. Mm -hmm. Because the people for, here are amazing. For many years, I was flying all over the world from New York, mm -hmm. and uh, I lived. 15 minutes away from the airport. <laughs> That's true. It's a really easy place to get to somewhere from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Valerie, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time out. It is an honor, always. Thank Scott, you. you're, you're amazing. And keep doing what you are doing. I, I really I really am honored. And I thank you so much for, for opening uh, your hospitality so that I could have a great conversation with you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. I hope you did too. Um, did. Thank you to everyone who watched. We'll be live next week. Uh, um, so I'll see you guys later. Valerie, will you stick around for one second? I shall. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who watched. We'll be live next Friday at three, I think, with uh, Semi-Attractive Boy. So I'll see you guys later. Wow. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,